Kabahayawatha Kamene. Um, we'd like to uh, begin our conversation, uh, just our our uh, our live uh, honoring our brother or brothers, I should say, uh, in particular, um, Professor Dr. Renoko Rashidi, uh, probably one of the most prolific scholars in our generation, um, a personal friend. We were going to do a tour together uh, going to uh, Spain and Morocco and uh, Senegal, but it didn't quite work out. So what we decided to do was to um, just postpone it for maybe a couple of years. But just to tell you about Renoko Rashidi um, and my uh, exposure to him, he and Legrand Clegg invited me to... Uh, speak at a conference in 1986. Uh, this was the first time in, in my career that I had ever gone out and spoke publicly. And it was Professor John Henry Clark at the time who gave me permission to be able to uh, go out as, a, as someone who considers someone their teacher, their jegna. Uh, you always wait for their permission to go out and do your work. And this was the first time. And it was uh, my brother Renoko and an, and an attorney by the name of Legrand Clegg in Los Angeles that invited me out to do a, uh, a presentation. And the panel that I was on was titled Unsung Heroes. And they had heard the work I had done on William Leo Hansberry and they asked me if I would do my presentation on William Leo Hansberry. Another brilliant scholar by the name of James Spady, he did his presentation on J.A. Rogers. And Dr. Charles Finch did a presentation on Sheikh Anta Jup, the great Senegalese scholar. This was my first time out. So in so many different ways, everything that I'm doing today started in November of 1986 with Renoko inviting me out to Compton College to do this uh, presentation. But through the years, one of the things that stands out to me most about Renoko, and I used to always tell him this, I used to always like sign on or sign off by calling him the eyes around the world. And by that I meant this brother had gone to over 111 countries. He had documented, photographed, photographs of Africans all around the world, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Vietnam, India. He had created special relationships with the Dalit Panthers, the Africans, the Kushites of India. Uh, he brought us together on so many different levels with Africans around the world by, in many ways, being our ambassador, being our diplomat, representing us in various parts of the world because whether we realize it or not, people around the world do not know us. I'm speaking of African Americans right now, and Africans in the diaspora, but specifically African Americans. They don't know us. I remember when I first went to Kemet, many of the Nubians, the Africans, um, thought, and it may be hard for you to believe this, but those within the community, <coughs> some didn't realize because they had been taught that Africans were enslaved in America. Some of them didn't realize that we were no longer enslaved. See, family, this is, the world doesn't know us. In many ways, we don't know ourselves. That's why I'm coming on to you today. But the point I'm making is that Renoko acted as our ambassador. He brought us together in, in, uh, all, uh, in places around the world that we may never have known. He went into the small enclaves and the small communities in, in Asia, in Europe. I mean, his, his collection of photographs on Africans in Europe is phenomenal. His books, and I'm going to tell you now, get his book now. Find a way to get to Renoko Rashidi and all of his work because I know his work is going to skyrocket in price in the not-too-distant future. But Renoko Rashidi, phenomenal brother, phenomenal um, individual that brought great knowledge and wisdom. I, I, I learned so much from my brother Renoko, particularly as it related to Africans around the world that I may not have known. 
He brought customs that they have that are that mirror what we do, but in their own cultural environment. The connections that he made, the people that he knew. He was one of the editors of uh, the Journal of um, African Civilization, along with Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. And so, Renoko Rashidi is very important to us. But like in all things that are, uh, he has now joined the ancestors. He is now part of that team that watches over us and will guide us and will take us where we have to go. Uh, his his uh, heart has been weighed by the feather of Ma'at. It has been found to be lighter than the feather. And I am sure that he is in a mentor now, um, getting ready <laughs> to solve our issues that we have here. He has joined all those that came before us. From Nat Turner to Harriet Tubman to Malcolm X to Martin Luther King, Shashi McIntyre, to all of those of your families that have joined the ancestors and my family. They're all one now. And they're watching over us, guiding us. If you listen carefully, you will hear. That's what Bob Marley tells us. There's a natural mystic in the air. Listen carefully and you will hear. I posted up... Um, photographs of Renoco in Mexico. He had gone to Mexico a, a number of times. He led tours showing the African presence in America. And so what I'd like to do with us this time around is I, I just want to break this down very simply because I've, I've been looking at the posts that you've been putting up, those that have responded to some of the posts I've been putting up lately about Africans in America. Um, I went in 1984 with Dr. Van Sertema, and I studied in Mexico with Dr. Van Sertema in 1984. Uh, every place that he went, in fact, I've often said that Dr. Van Sertema did for us, and he only did it one time. It was with the Achnefer study group. And um, Sister Dorothy and Sister Araminta uh, were the uh, chairs of that uh, tour, which is which is a phenomenal. I had to get an American Express card to go there because I just didn't have the money, but I had to go because I knew just somewhere in me, I didn't think it was going to happen again. And I was right. It did not happen again. But with this opportunity, there were 40 of us that, that traveled from all around the country to be with Dr. Van Sertima in Mexico, and he took us to various places. So what I'm say saying to you now as it relates to one part of our history is evidenced by me it, it is not research I've done. There's other things I've done research on. I'm going to expand what I'm going to say to you as time goes on, but I just want to get to this point with you now because I just want to break this down for us to understand. This is something that Ronoko said frequently. All life started in Africa, in the geographic location that we today call the Great Lakes region. It encompasses what we today call Central Africa and Southern Africa. Because now that the countries, because of the Berlin Conference of 1885, because Africa has been carved up into countries, we cannot perceive Africa as it really was, nation state wise. So that I'm giving you this general location. There is an area in Central Africa that is known, there is a mountain range, it's known as Virunga. It's in the general area of Rwanda, up in that area right next to Uganda, in um, that general region. And there are mountains in that area. Now I know that there are those that have problems identifying with the fact that bone for bone, muscle for muscle, 99.9% .9 of everything that humans have, gorillas have too, in the same place, on their body, and it functions the same exact way. The real differences between apes, if you want to call them that, and humans is in the brain, particularly in the limbic system and in the 12 pigmented sections, the locus corelius. 
we'll get into that deeper down the road. There's science to this. There's Dr. Richard King, uh, Dr. Uh, Edward Bruce Bynum. I, I, could, I could go through the list of scholars that speak on this issue. I'm going to leave it there for now because there are, I, I, I just want to take you through a sequence of events that's going to bring us to America so that we can understand this uh, from a scientific perspective and not emotion. In this general region, the Virunga Mountains, V-I-R-U-N-G-A. On PBS, what was interesting is that um, that um, Avery Brooks, the actor played in uh, Deep Space Nine, Star Trek, he did a three-part series on the gorillas in the Virunga Mountains. In this general area, from where the Panjids, because this is where we have to look at, at one time there was an entity. I'm going to call it an entity now because it wasn't human and it wasn't ape, but it was the ancestor of both the, the what we today call the gorilla and the human. And in this area, Something occurred in the mountains that split this, some people call it Ramapithecus. I don't know what we're going to call it. I mean, I care what you call it. What I care about is the fact that it existed and from that point of departure, we'll get a name for it down the road. We'll be more specific and we'll probably elaborate on who and what this entity was. It lived in the trees. At this, at, at this time in history, there was, the earth was just full of greenery, trees and plants and ferns, deep uh, rainforest, or if you want to call it jungle, whatever you'd like to uh, call it. And it was in this area that you see this occurring that for whatever reason, a group of those Ramapithecae came down onto the earth, walking on the savanna, walking on the earth itself, while another branch of them remained in the tree. The ones that came down on the earth, many times they would go back up, and then they would come back down. And so it becomes important to understand how this works, and to look at the science of it, not let the emotion get into it, and definitely do not let any religious book dictate how you're going to view this. Fundamentally, the ones that came down on the earth, eventually they stayed on the earth. They learned how to live on the land and they never returned back into the tree. What would have happened is the ones that remained in the tree became who we call the Panjid, which would be the five great apes, if you want to call them that. It's the ape or the gorilla. Uh, it is the chimpanzee, the orangutan. You know, you could go to the list. There were five of them that um, re remained in the tree. The ones that came down on the earth, they are called the hominid. So you have the pongid in the tree, you have the hominid on the ground. Because of their lifestyle, they had to learn how to live a different lifestyle. In learning how to live a different lifestyle, they picked up a different way of, of eating. Uh, when we were in the trees, there were things that we ate in the trees. Maybe we'd come down, get a little something on the ground, but we'd go back in the tree. But the ones that got down on the ground and stayed on the ground began to develop another way of living, another, which caused them to think differently. When you think differently, you start to develop a framework of thought you begin to hunt, you begin to gather in order to eat. And so in this process, the hominid in Central and Southern Africa, because remember right off to their right, right off to their west is these is is these mountains, these Varinga Mountains. All of us, all of those of us have come out of this experience. No no matter how you may look at it scientifically. Apes and humans. Humans did not evolve out of apes. Apes and humans have a common ancestor. And so 
what began to happen is that these ones that came down on the ground began to think differently and they began to develop themselves differently. In so doing, the more they thought, the better they ate, the better they ate, the more they thought, the more they thought, the better they ate. So the cycle became agriculture. So that these individuals went from being hunters and gatherers to agriculturalists. But let me take you back to the beginning as to how this happened. As these hominids on the ground began to develop themselves, their bodies began to change. Not gr greatly, but like, for instance, uh, uh, you notice that gorillas have opposable, well, we all have opposable thumbs and we have, uh, well, gorillas have opposable feet where they can use their, their big toe like it's a thumb. Well, what began to happen is that with human walking on the ground, they began to push that big toe so that they wouldn't step on it all the time. So they began to put it up so that it wouldn't happen. Eventually, it became the toe that we have today. It was no longer opposable. It was now aligned with the foot itself.